In the weeks following Pearl Harbor, the American public was locked in a state of fear. Never before had the country been attacked so suddenly by a foreign adversary on its own soil. The nation fired on all cylinders, working towards the cause of preserving American democracy. Fearful and defensive, Americans sought unity through scrap metal drives, victory gardens, and gas rations, but also through propaganda campaigns targeting people of Japanese ancestry. Japanese Americans were depicted as dangerous saboteurs who were subversive to the war effort, a sentiment that was reinforced by rampant misinformation and xenophobia. In Portland, Oregon, a young attorney worked furiously to resolve the new legal challenges faced by his community. A second-generation Japanese American, Minoru Yasui, had been raised on the orchards of Hood River, Oregon, where a wave of immigrants settled in the early 1900s against the idyllic backdrop of the Columbia River. As the century progressed, the community in Hood River found itself the subject of increasing antagonism from the general public. The economic success of Hood River's orchards, combined with the widespread belief that the Japanese were unassimilable, caused many to resent the newfound community. In 1917 in Oregon, the first bill for an anti-alien land law in Oregon was actually submitted by a Hood River senator. And two years later, Hood River formed an anti-alien association. It was in this uncertain environment that Yasui grew up. He excelled in school, becoming the first American citizen of Japanese descent to graduate from the University of Oregon School of Law and to pass the Oregon Bar. A second lieutenant in the ROTC, Yasui reported for military duty after Pearl Harbor, but was turned away because of his heritage. In the weeks following, the government began arresting Japanese community leaders, subjecting them to hours of searches and interrogations. Among those arrested was Yasui's father, Masuo, who was taken to a detention camp in Montana. Evidence used against him included children's drawings of the Panama Canal, which the authorities believed was proof of espionage. Tides continued to shift against the Japanese Americans as the government ramped up its efforts to restrict the population. The man leading the charge was Lieutenant General John DeWitt, who had previously spent over four decades in uniform. Stern and uncompromising, DeWitt would stop at nothing to protect the West Coast against what he saw as a dire military threat. He also said to a congressional committee, quote, a Jap's a Jap, unquote. And the type of racism that he's expressing is that because of genetics or blood, you are destined to be disloyal. DeWitt's radical ideas eventually made their way to the White House. On February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, delegating unilateral power to DeWitt and other military leaders. DeWitt, now with the force of the executive order behind him, passed a series of military proclamations in the following weeks. Among these was a curfew, requiring all persons of Japanese ancestry to remain in their homes after 8 p.m. The curfew stood as another manifestation of the public's fear, a legitimization of the country's distrust toward the Japanese. It makes you feel inferior. It makes you singled out. It makes your ethnic group degraded, demoralized. Minoru Yasui believed the curfew order to be not only a violation of his personal liberties, but a betrayal of the spirit and letter of the Constitution. But to challenge this barrier of injustice meant facing the full force of the U.S. government, a daunting task for a young attorney. Yet his resolve did not waver. I felt that we owed at least the obligation as a citizen to tell our government they are wrong. That is the sacred duty of every citizen. Because what is done to the least of us can be done to all of us. I knew that we had to protest this. On a Saturday night in March of 1942, Yasui left his law office to take a walk in downtown Portland, deliberately violating the curfew. At only 25 years old, Yasui was willing to sacrifice his life and liberty to fight for justice. I walked for over three hours, and during that period, I got tired of walking up and down Third Avenue, so I did approach a police officer 
So we went up to the policeman and um, asked to be arrested. And the policeman said, go home, Sonny, you're going to get in trouble. So he actually walked into the Portland police station and said, here are my papers. I'm Japanese American. It's after the curfew. Uh, please arrest me. The sergeant obliged me and he threw me into the drunk tank. So that's how the case began at 11.20 p.m., 28th day of March, 1942. At his trial, the judge sentenced him to a year in prison and a $5,000 fine. He was held in solitary confinement for nine months in a six by eight foot windowless cell. Yasui kept fighting, ultimately bringing his case before the Supreme Court. The court heard his case alongside a similar one, Hirabayashi v. United States, in which a student in Washington was convicted of violating the same curfew that Yasui had a month earlier. In the trial, the government argued that the curfew was a military necessity and that certain racial characteristics of Japanese Americans justified the order. With a unanimous ruling on June 21st, 1943, Yasui's conviction was upheld. <laughs> Having served his sentence, Yasui traded one prison for another. He was taken to Minidoka Relocation Center, where he and thousands of Japanese were incarcerated until the end of the war. Conditions in the camp were bleak. I'm listening. I hear men whispering, I hear babies crying, I hear women weeping. What am I listening to? I am listening to the sounds of shattered lives. Shattered lives. 120,000 Japanese. Upon release, Yasui moved to Denver, Colorado, where he continued to fight for civil rights. With the Japanese American Citizens League, he lobbied against racist legislation and chaired the National Committee for Redress, uniting individuals across the nation in the campaign for a government apology and restitution for wartime incarceration. Not because it affected 120,000 Japanese Americans, but it affects all Americans. In 1983, Yasui, along with a team of lawyers, petitioned to reopen his World War II case, citing new evidence suggesting the curfew was not based on military necessity, but on race. The district court vacated his conviction, but refused to rule on the issue of racial discrimination. Yasui persisted, once again appealing his case. Over 40 years after he broke the curfew in downtown Portland, Yosui was still determined to right the wrongs committed by the government. But on November 12th, 1986, Yosui died from cancer while waiting for his case to be heard. His ashes were buried beneath a pair of giant cedars in his hometown of Hood River. Just two weeks after his passing, the Supreme Court declined to hear his case, ruling it moot since the petitioner was deceased. His decades-long legal battle had come to an end. However, Minoru Yasui's legacy carried on. Two years after his death, President Reagan issued a formal apology and reparations for victims of incarceration, marking a victory for the redress movement. In 2015, Yasui was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the country. And a year later, the Oregon legislature designated March 28th, the day he broke the curfew, as Minoru Yasui Day, immortalizing his act of courage. I think his legacy is that as one person, you can literally change the world. He was committed to justice. He was committed to his family, his community. He fought for us. At just 25 years old, Minoru Yasui put his reputation, career, and personal liberties on the line to challenge the government's wrongdoing. For Yasui, fighting against injustice was not a choice, but an obligation. He lived life by a simple motto, one he would often repeat. We are born into this world for a purpose, to make it a better place for our having been there. As old barriers persist and new barriers emerge, Yasui's actions serve as an example to all. It begins with an act of courage, even something as simple as a late night stroll.